so first of all, I agree with the vision of political class independence. Um, and this is something that the left has always strived for. Uh, all portions of the left, the great struggles of the 19th century, the struggles of even the construction of the Second International and whatnot, were about creating political independence and creating political dependence from liberalism uh, in, in particular. Both the Lasallians and, and the Marxists uh, were, were fighting for this. The question is, just having a slogan, just having the rhetoric isn't enough. We have to have a much more difficult question of why hasn't this worked? This has been our rhyme for literally 100 years. Uh, like, it's not because we haven't said it enough. Saying something over and over again doesn't actually do anything. It hasn't worked because of a variety of factors. One was the extreme violence of the U.S. state suppressing the workers' movement in the 1890s, using the force of the U.S. Um, state to scatter the Socialist Party in the 1910s, scatter the IWW, scatter all these, these, these movements. There's a variety of other more boring political science you know, answers. One is that uh, you know, U U.S. workers had a uh, many of them had already had suffrage and already were voting for two major parties, and the ballot system was designed to prevent the emergence of third parties. Um, and some of them were just contingent. There were certain moments where we had the opportunity to build an independent party in the 1890s, the 1920s, to some degree in the 1930s and 40s, but those avenues weren't pursued partially as a result of the trade union bureaucracy, partially as a result of mistakes by leaders, partially as a result of just trying those, those things but, but failing. But the failures weren't just a string of failures. They were cumulative. You know, one failure made it harder to do it the next time, the next time, and the next time until we end up in our fairly miserable uh, present where the majority of Americans don't have a party that, that represents their majority interests. But I think there's a difference between... The response to that by some members of the socialist um, left, the majority response in the American movement has historically been, therefore, we have to deal with what we have. We have to go into the Democratic Party and we have to realign the Democratic Party and make it function something like these European labor and social democratic parties have. That was the old strategy. I think there's a there's still portions of DSA and portions of the left that is pursuing that party in certain, in certain ways. Um, this is the... Uh, kind of strategy of the Justice Democrats with uh, Alexandria Shazio Cortez and others are are uh, associated with. What we're proposing, people around Jacob and others, is something different, which is just simply, we are using the Democratic ballot line, and we are running as open socialists with our own programs, our own basis of funding, and we're using that bully pulpit to run competitive races that sometimes win and sometimes don't. And we're making socialism relevant to millions of people who never heard of socialism before as a result. Now, is that political class independence or is it not? If I run tomorrow on a Republican ballot line in, in a city, in a partisan race, and I run as an open socialist, I run with my own source of funding, with my own 10-point program, am I now a tool of the Republican Party? It just, we, uh, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem logical to me. I'm not saying these parties are empty vessels to be transformed. I'm saying that we could use propagandistically the ballot lines, and it's actually been working. So th this was a theoretical discussion. I used to have this debate with ISOers uh, three, four years ago, and I thought both positions were reasonable, and it was a reasonable debate then. I believe this debate has been resolved, and that tactically it's been useful, and tactically it's still been an independent left uh, strategy to connect our disparate, really small working socialist movement with a wider workers' movement. John, do you think that it's been resolved? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, I, I think that's still the key question that needs to be uh, sorted out. I mean, it is true that, that you know, DSA growing to 50,000 members, I think that's fantastic uh, development. It shows uh, not only are people calling themselves socialists, but they actually actively want to get involved in something. Um, but, but it is true that it is a very broad, amorphous, uh, when you talk about 95 million people in a poll that sort of say, yeah, I'd be open to socialism, that doesn't mean they've read, you know, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, whatever. doesn't mean they necessarily have to, uh, as long as they're fighting around a, a clear program that I would argue has to transcend the bounds of capitalism. But it is a huge step forward. 
Um, but I was, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, there's no question about it. He blew things wide open and put socialism on the map in a way that I would argue had never happened in this country before. Uh, I mean, the last time socialism was, was that popular was back when Eugene Debs was thrown in jail. I mean, you know, literally 100 plus years ago. But I, 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 I was a little bit surprised. I mean, I'm surprised that people that consider themselves socialists still say they support Bernie Sanders after you know what ended up happening at the DNC in the city, uh, a lot of people that were here in Philly at that time must have felt what what that was like, uh, and th this capitulation to, to Clinton to say, well, this is just the world we live in. Uh, what are you going to do? Vote vote for Hillary, uh, even if you looked a little bit disgusted uh, as he said it. Um, a, a lot of people, I think, realized that uh, that that was uh, a dead end, and a lot of people, I think, will never be going back to the Democratic Party after that. So um, I think that uh, it's absolutely true. A lot of people, a lot of Republicans can be won to socialist ideas on a class basis. During the 2016 elections, San, uh, Trump, when he would talk about Hillary, you, you know, you know what kind of crowds, what kind of comments people would say. But whenever he talked about Sanders, he was very careful not to go after him because there was kind of a, a reverent silence around Sanders because he was talking about things that they need in the Rust Belt, jobs, healthcare, education. Um, so I think that that's... Uh, uh, interesting that on a class basis, both of those parties can be blown apart. It's not going to be just the, the Democrats, but the Republicans. Um, I, I like this this imagery of uh, W. B. Uh, w. B. Uh, du Bois, who who uh, talking about uh, in, in a book about John Brown. He talked about how all the different streams of of, uh, of dissatisfaction were streaming inexorably towards what ended up be becoming the conflagration of the Civil War. And I think what we're seeing now with this thaw of, uh, of, of decades of sort of anti-socialist ideas is the beginnings of those streams, uh, different currents of struggle starting to come together towards what will eventually uh, be a raging river that I think will have the power to smash right through all the dams that capitalism puts up to try to, uh, to keep it back. And I think that we have to, if we look at history, the consciousness of the working class uh, leaps ahead, uh, you know, very dramatically at certain stages. We can't judge the future by the past, and we can't judge uh, the, the way people think, uh, you know, five years from now from, from the way people think today. Um, and, and I think that, that that's that's important. And so the question of political class political independence, um, I don't see how you can be one can be in favor of it while at the same time saying that we could, you know, run as a Democrat or a Republican, and it doesn't matter. In a country where American, in a country like the United States, where people look at things in a pretty black and white way, I think that if you say, vote Democrat, because I'm running as a Democrat, and I would never run as a Democrat, but if you know, if you say that, you're then responsible for whatever the Democrats uh, do. I mean, maybe not, you know, you, I mean, I mean, look, you mentioned uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, look, look, look what's happened already since the nomination or, you know, winning the, the primary to, to where we are today. Um, and, and I think a lot of people didn't want to hear it when it was said that, look, I mean, if you, if you, you know, you, you work in that party, you're going to be bound by, by its rules. And that's, that's basically what's happening. Uh, so I, I think that, that that's important. As far as the violence of the capitalist state stopping the working class from forming its own political party, I mean, all, all capitalist states, all states are violent. I mean, if you look at Tsarist Russia, they weren't able to stop uh, the Russian Revolution from happening. Even in countries like Iran, for example, the, the Shah's state apparatus wasn't able to stop itself from being overturned at a certain point. And pretty much every country... Uh, in in the in the so-called advanced uh, you know capitalist world has a workers party you know or at least one, at one point did a mass socialist party communist party labor party etc some political vehicle for expressing themselves they weren't stopped so I don't think it'd be fair to say that there's a there's a unique American exceptionalism that has prevented that I would argue uh, and you kind of alluded to this that it's by mistakes of the leadership the mistake of, of the leadership or the lack of a leadership that understands the need to do that the fact that uh, several times when there were opportunities to move in that direction. For example, in the 1930s with the rise of the CIO, which was an elemental class struggle uh, taking place in the big new industries that were you know, erupting in, the, in all parts of the country, really. Uh, you had a new kind of trade unionism, a new workers' movement emerge, and there was the possibility to give that uh, a workers' expression. You have states like Minnesota that did have uh, a, a farmer labor party that actually went had a pretty advanced program and actually pretty advanced uh, conditions for the working class in Minnesota in the 1930s compared to what we have to deal with uh, in the rest of the country today. So I don't think that that's an insuperable uh, obstacle. As far as the structures of, of the capitalist uh, uh, setup being completely rigged and being undemocratic and, and you know, really 
uh, you know, set up for a two-party system, even though there's nothing about that in the Constitution. Again, I think that if there's enough of an elemental upsurge and a will and a, and a way forward pointed by the labor leadership, by the left leadership, then people will start to, to see that direction. But when you have the labor leadership saying, oh, no, don't move in that direction, or you have, and you have the leaders of the socialist movement saying, oh, no, don't go in that direction. Let's run maybe as a Republican. Let's run maybe as, as a Democrat. You're, you're, you're not offering a vision and perspective. And I think if people want to know where to go, you have to, you know, they have to be able to see where that might be. 